and planes Repeat the sounding joy Repeat the sounding joy Repeat, repeat the sound of
Shalom. Welcome brothers and sisters to our online church service this morning. The psalmist declares in Psalms 30 verse 4, Sing praise to the Lord, 
all his faithful people. Remember what the Holy One has done and give him thanks. So, brothers and sisters, let's prepare our heart to worship the Lord together. Let's look to God in prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us another day to experience your grace and goodness. Here we are to render our worship and thanksgiving which due unto you alone. We welcome your powerful presence into our homes where we are gathered and we pray that you will bind us together wherever we are with your love. We ask that each of us will encounter you in a fresh manner today. In Jesus' wonderful name, Amen. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You rest so with the sinner's heart. Fast the waters and to mercy And nothing can keep us apart So remember, so remember Your people, remember Your children, remember Your promise, so oh God Yeah. 
Firstly, a word of thanks to the worship team for leading us in a time of praise and worship. Let us prepare our hearts as we give our tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your presence with us, for your protection over us, and for your provision of good health, food, money, and resources. We come before you to offer our tithes and offerings as our acts of worship. We thank you for the opportunity to be part of your kingdom's work. We praise you and thank you in Jesus name. Dearly beloved, let's prepare our hearts to hear the word of God. Good morning fellow Cebesians. Uh, it's a great joy to be with you again on the on our digital platform service and uh, thank you for joining us. We trust that you will be blessed by what God uh, wants to say to us this morning. Today we are going to start on a new uh, sub-team called The Key to Happiness and Fulfillment uh, Lies in Our Significance. You know, many, many in the world uh, lives aiming for happiness and fulfillment in their lives. Being happy is, is a goal that most of us have. You say you'll be happy if you are fulfilled. And uh, so we spend a, a lot of our time pursuing what we think happiness is and what we think fulfillment uh, uh, is. Right? And uh, today we want to tackle this important uh, subject and uh, something that is one of life's biggest question you know in fact uh Coursera, one of the top uh, biggest online program provider uh, has even a program called a life of happiness and fulfillment and uh, offered by the uh, indian business school and uh, th this course you know is taken by nearly four hundred thousand students and and uh, that shows you how the world is actually looking for an answer, looking for what de determines a happy and fulfilled life. And, and so today, we want to start tackling this important sub subject, uh, not from a business school perspective, but from a biblical perspective, what has the Bible uh, got to say about uh, happiness and fulfilment and uh, uh, what has the Bible got to say about significance? Okay. So, so to start off this series, I, I want to lay a little bit uh, background so that we understand the, the, the terms. What do we mean when we talk about significance? You know, uh, significance is importance, worthy, relevance. These are some out of the words impact. So, so when we say that our life uh, has significance. It means that our, our life has meaning, our life has impact, uh, our life is worthy, our life has value. And, and this is something which every human being uh, looks, looks for and yearns for. Uh, a, a, a life that they, they know has an impact in the world and, and they want to be recognized and have some significance in, in, in the world. Okay, so that's what significance is. Uh, what about fulfillment and happiness? Okay. Um, you know, fulfillment, if you look at the dictionary, is, is defined usually as a feeling of happiness and satisfaction at having achieved uh, or accomplished something in life, uh, whether it's a desire, a goal, or, or, or a promise. Right? And, and it's, it's a sense of elation, a sense of happiness that comes. Uh, uh, for example, if you say that, okay, you set a goal, you want to run a marathon, and you finish that marathon, uh, you, you feel a, a sense of fulfillment. That's, that's what fulfillment is. Now, happiness, on the other hand, is a bit more difficult to define. In fact, it is a word that, uh, that uh, uh, even psychologists find very difficult to say what happiness is because it actually means something different to different uh, each individual person, right? So if you ask 10 people what happiness is, they will give you 10 different uh, answers, okay? Uh, but for the sake of our, our discussion, the sake of our uh, topic, right? Uh, we can roughly know where, what 
happiness is. We know what it is, but to define it, uh, it's not so easy. So I, I want to go to the psychologist, also science of psychology, okay, to, to uh, get a, at least a little bit help in the definition. So the, the founding father of positive psychology, uh, Martin Seligman, uh, describes happiness as experiencing frequent positive emotions, uh, such as joy, excitement and contentment, uh, combined with deeper feelings of meaning and purpose. Okay. So, so he talks about happiness as uh, related to meaning and purpose in, in, in life. So happiness implies a positive mood emotions in the present and a positive outlook for the future. In other words, uh, you're also looking forward to, to a, a positive outlook in the future, not just for the now. Uh, that comes with deeper feelings of meaning and purpose. So you, you cannot talk about happiness without talking ab about meaning and purpose, right? And, and uh, so we want to look at a biblical perspective, right? We want to go to the Bible. Uh, we do not want to rely on, on science to see what uh, uh, ha happiness and significance and fulfillment is. You know, the need for significance is one of the most sought after human uh, needs. Uh, there's not a person alive on the planet who doesn't want to feel important or needed or worthy or that your life has an impact or your life makes a difference. Right? So, so significance is a compelling force to our happiness and fulfilment. Okay? Uh, the opposite is also true. Right? So if, if you are feeling insignificant, uh, it will make you feel devastated. It will rob you of your happiness and fulfillment. Okay? So uh, we feel happy and fulfilled when our lives have significance, importance and worth uh, found in meaning and purpose of life. This is uh, the direction we want to move along. So the, the question I want to ask us is how can we feel significance constructively? and productively and not destructively because you can also feel that you, you are significant uh, by robbing people. So, so the question for us is how can we rewrite our life story to be productively significant? Okay? Uh, this, this is uh, where we are uh, going with. Okay? And we often spend a, a lifetime looking for a sense of happiness, fulfillment and significance. No, our, our natural instinct is to look for, for all these things in people, in places, and in things. Okay? Uh, uh, and we look to one of these three sources, or all, all three, you know, for the happiness and fullness of life we uh, really want. But, but in the reality of life, uh, these are often wrong locations to, to, to seek. You know? uh, in fact, someone describes this like uh, if you seek for for happiness fulfillment significance in people in places in things uh, in in things like uh, uh, wealth uh, in people uh, like like your your family all right and, and if you try to to no no doubt these things can bring you happiness but if you seek these thing these places as a source of, of happiness uh, you you will be seeing not, Nothing but a mirage, you know. You know a mirage, right? If you are in the desert and you really want wa water, okay, and and uh, uh, your mind will start playing tricks with you, and you will start seeing mirages. In other words, you will start in your mind to see pools of water, but when you actually get there, there is no water, okay. And and uh, looking for happiness, fulfillment, significance in this uh, sources is like that, okay. And and. Uh, uh, we need to seek first the correct source of life, not a mi mirage. Okay? And significance does not come from people, including our natural abilities, gifting or talent, nor people, places, nor things, but from God, our Creator. And, and this is the essence of what we need to, to understand. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1 says, Remember your Creator. You know, Ecclesiastes is an is a, is a interesting book to look at when you want to look at purpose and meaning of life. I, I, and I, want, I, want, I will be drawing a, a little bit of our lessons from, from this book. Okay? And so life, uh, Ecclesiastes, Solomon says that life has no meaning, purpose, fulfillment, pleasure, happiness, significance without our Creator, without the context of our 
created. And, and this is also reflected in uh, the, the American Constitution. You, you know the American, right, when they declared their, their Constitution, uh, they said this, we hold this truth to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. So they, un they understood the Americans, in the early founders or the early fathers of America, understood that, that the, without the context of the Creator, there is no pursuit of happiness. You will be pursuing a mirage. Okay? And, and, and so, uh, but now they have forgotten this. Okay? And we need to go back to, 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 to this fundamental. And why is this so? Because humans are made in the image of God. Right? And each of us carries a unique expression of God. Uh, in fact, Psalm 8, 3 to 4 says this, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, you, you know, the, the psalmist was so fascinated. Uh, when, we, when he says that, when he looked at the whole vastness of the universe, the moon, the stars, and the, the heavens, and then he says, what is man? You know, this little... Uh, 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 kitchi mind man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him right and and uh, uh, the, the psalmist was questioning and asking this so against this backdrop of a universe so spectacular and what the scripture poses this question what is man that you are mindful of him all right uh, uh, why is man so significant to to you and why is man so uh, important to, to, to you, right? So the scriptural fact is this, that God's is, God is mindful of us. He visits us and, and uh, essentially because we are created in His image. And so significance is attributed to us by God, okay? Uh, to that which He created in His image. And so in Ecclesiastes 2.26, the Bible tells us that to the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy or happiness or biblical happiness. Right? So, so it is a gift of, of God, happiness, fulfilled life. It's a gift of God and can only be understood in the context of our Creator, our, our God. And this is in line with what Dina found out that uh, we were actually programmed to be happy right? uh, because we were programmed to, to have God in, in, in our lives. So, so we want to talk about the key to happiness and fulfillment, our significance, all right, uh, from a biblical perspective, from understanding that life has no meaning, purpose, fulfillment, pleasure, uh, uh, happiness, significance without our Creator God. And so we are going to be looking at this over the next three Sundays, okay, uh, and uh, talking about investing for eternity, talking about a relationship with God, talking about life mission, okay, in, in, in God, uh, as, as uh, where our significance comes from. And if we can, can uh, find significance in life, we will find happiness and fulfillment. So this morning, I want to start with investing for eternity. You know, when Steve Jobs founded Apple, uh, we, we all know this story, especially if you are in the management uh, circle. And uh, he wanted to find a marketing person. You know, and he wanted to find a very good marketing man. Uh, so he, he started to, to look, for, look around. And then he wanted John Scully. John Scully was at that time uh, the marketing guru of uh, Pepsi. Okay? And uh, he wanted... John Scully, because John Scully was a very good marketing uh, expert. And John Scully hesitated, although Steve Jobs uh, told him about all his vision and, and uh, how computer is going to change uh, the, the world. And finally, uh, to convince John Scully, uh, Steve Jobs asked John Scully, you know, uh, do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugar water? Okay? Or do you want a chance to change the world? Uh, you, you know, all these soft drinks are actually basically sugar water. So, so that was what he challenged John Scully with, and, and uh, that challenge caused John Scully to, to join Apple, okay, as, as we know. So I want, us, I want to ask us the same question. Do, do you want to make sugar water, okay, in your life here on, on this earth for the Lord? Right? Or do you want to make a difference in your life and to invest in something that really matters in the kingdom of God? 
Okay. Uh, how do you want to write or rewrite your life story to, to have significance? Because significance can only be found in, 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 in God. All right? So I, I want to challenge us this mo- morning to invest for eternity and do not invest for the temporal because the, the investing for the temporal is not going to bring any significance to our lives. At the same time, I also want to make sure that as we look at investment, uh, we don't get drawn in, into investment, uh, false investment and investment scams. Okay? Uh, we want to do the right, right investment. Okay? So I want to, to talk to us this morning about a correct biblical perspective of eternity. We need to understand what the Bible says eternity uh, is because before we can even talk about investing for eternity. And then I want to talk about to invest in the things that the scriptures say are eternal ROI. You know, when you talk about investment, you have to talk about ROI, return on investment. And we want to make sure that this return on investment right, is eternal so that it is still there. It is not just on this uh, uh, earth. Okay, so that is the, uh, what we'll be looking at today. So let's go to look at the a biblical understanding of eternity first. Okay, uh, to understand eternity, we've got to understand it in three contexts. Okay, uh, the first context I want to talk about is the context of a God that's eternal, a Father that's eternal. All right, the second context I want to talk about is time. Right? Uh, if we don't have a perspective and understanding of time, uh, uh, to the now time and the eternal time, uh, it, it's going to be very difficult to talk about invest, investing. Okay? And, and the third thing I want to talk about is how to understand pain and pleasure from an eternal perspective. Because if we don't understand pain and, and, and pleasure uh, uh, in the context of eternity, we, we will be spending all our time avoiding pain and uh, uh, indulging in pleasures. And that's where all our investment will go. All right? So, so I, I want us to have this, this understanding. So let's, let's uh, uh, start with uh, eternal creator, God and Father. So life has no meaning, we, we said just now, right? Uh, uh, Purpose, fulfillment, significance without our Creator God. And, and we know this came from Ecclesi- Ecclesiastes. Okay? And in fact, Ecclesiastes, King Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes, was actually a seeker on a quest for the significance, meaning, and purpose of life. So if really we want to have a good understanding of life and its purpose, you need to read Ecclesiastes. Okay? Uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 16, uh, Solomon said, I commune with my heart, saying, Look, I have attained greatness, and I have gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge. And we know that, that uh, the, the wisdom of Solomon was given by God. And, and so he had a wisdom about life that nobody else has in, 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 in the world. And, and so he said in verse 17, I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. Right? Um, not that Solomon is insane, but madness and folly in Old Testament usually refers to a life without God. Uh, I perceive that this is also grasping for the wind. In other words, uh, Solomon said that when he tried to understand life, right, he, he said this, that in the context of life without God, it is madness and folly. And uh, madness and folly and life is like grasping for the wind. Uh, uh, you, you cannot really grasp and understanding uh, a comprehension of life without the context of, of God. Right? And in Ecclesiastes 8, 12, it says, Still I know that I, it will go well for those who fear God, who fear Him openly. So, so he always talks about, brings us back to the context of, of God. In Ecclesiastes 9, 1, I've taken all this to my heart, even to examine it all, that righteous people, wise people, and their deeds are in the hand of God. So all that we do, all that we lay, labor, if we don't understand the context uh, of, of, of God, life will be like grasping for the wind. All right? And so finally, he closes Ecclesiastes in chapter 12, right? With, in 12 with this words. He says, remember your creator right? in the days of your youth, in the days of your life on, on, on this earth. Okay? 
uh, uh, before things happen to you and you say that you have no pleasure in life because you don't understand life and you don't understand life because you do not look at life in the context of an eternal creator. Right? So, so Solomon concluded in his quest that life is meaningless without the creator God. So God is not only our creator. We know that he's also our father, our eternal father. Now we know this from John chapter 17, verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the father, the only true God and Christ Jesus whom you have sent. So in, in other words, Jesus say eternal, define eternal life as uh, uh, knowing the father. Okay, so eternal life is knowing the Father, the eternal Father. And, and this goes in line with Ecclesiastes 3.11 when Solomon said, He has made everything beautiful and appropriate in his time. He has also planted eternity, a sense of divine purpose in the human heart. All right? So it is our Creator, God and Father, who has put eternity into man's heart. So without an eternal perspective, we cannot comprehend or grasp the idea of beginning to the end of life, both on earth and eternity. All right? So without the context of eternity and an eternal God and Father, life on earth is meaningless, purposeless, like grasping after the wind. Okay, so, so this is uh, 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 what we, we need to, to understand. The other thing that we need to understand is a perspective of time. Okay, we need to understand uh, what eternal time is versus the chronos or the earthly time and what kairos uh, um, means. Okay? Now, if, if I were to draw a, a dotted line across and you know, I put eternity past and eternity future along this, this line, uh, eternity past simply means that eternal time has no beginning. Eternity future means simply means that eternity is a time that will continue on and on and on and there's no ending. And, and if you draw this line with dots, chronos is essentially just one of the dots in this eternal time. All right? uh, so, so eternity is a time without beginning or end and continues forever, while chronos is the linear, sequential, chronological clock time on earth and will end one day when the earth Ends, okay, uh, and in this context, we also need to understand uh, when the Bible talks about time. The Bible also talks about Kairos time. Kairos time is simply eternity stepping into the Chronos time of man, or God, right, uh, stepping into the Chronos time of man. God coming into man's time. That's what. Uh, uh, Kairos simply means. So, Sue Peter 3 8, Peter said, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. That is the perspective of time we, we need to have an appreciation of. All right? Uh, so, to, to, together, Kronos and Kairos explain humanity's place in the temporal world uh, as it moves through it through uh, eternity, all right? So, so when we receive Christ, right, the, the, the Kairos time of God comes in, into us and, and, and we start to walk in the earthly time in the context of eternal time. This is what we, we need to, to try and understand. And this is when uh, Solomon then say in Ecclesiastes 3.1, he says that in, in this uh, uh, eternal time coming into Kronos time of, of man uh, in this Kairos time of God, uh, there is a season, a time appointed for everything and a time for every delight and event or purpose under heaven. Okay. So he says there's a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. A time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to Done. So there's a time for everything in, 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 in this uh, uh, place of, of, of uh, where we, we live in today. And, uh, and, and so it's in this context that we need to understand pain and pleasure. All right? You know, Ecclesiastes says a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance. In other words, uh, while we live in this chronos time on the earth, uh, there, there will be a time, a season of pain and a season of pleasure, all right? And, and we need to ex expect 
uh, that. And uh, so if we do not have a biblical perspective of pain and pleasure in our time on earth, uh, we will be investing our full efforts and our lives will be consumed in avoiding pain, all right? And in indulging in, in pleasure and our lives will not be uh, uh, involved in investing for eternity if we do not have the right perspective of pain and pleasure, all right? And, and uh, uh, so we cannot comprehend pain and pleasure in the now time without grasping this term that... Uh, it, Solomon used in Ecclesiastes. He says there's a season, a time appointed for everything, and a time for every delight or pain, an event or purpose under heaven. So we need to understand what this under heaven means. We saw already earlier that under heaven simply means that we need the context of the eternal God, our Father in heaven. And we need to understand time, chronos time on earth, in the context of the eternal time of, of God, and eternity of, of, of God. All right? So, so this is what under heaven uh, uh, means. So we need to understand uh, pain and pleasure in, in, in that sense. Okay? Uh, and we know this because in Ecclesiastes 2.24, Solomon says there's nothing better for a person than to eat and drink and show himself some good in his trouble. This too I have seen that is from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without God? All right? So for to a person who is good in his sight, he has given wisdom and knowledge and joy or biblical happiness. So while on this earth, right, and living in this life, living in this chronos time of this life, there will always be a time of pleasure and a time of pain, right? And, and uh, we, this, this uh, tension between the now and the not yet, Right? This, this tension is a necessary tension that will always exist between the now and the not yet of the kingdom because we, we know that the kingdom, which is an eternal kingdom, uh, uh, is not over, is not here yet. Right? The, the fullness of the eternity of the kingdom uh, will only be consumed or consummated when Jesus comes uh, again. So while waiting for, for that that time to come where we will be eternally with our Father and there will be no more pain and no more sorrow and, and no more tears. While waiting for, the, for that time, we need to wait patiently. We need to wait pati patiently uh, uh, because if we understand the, in the context of eternity, this time, right, whether for pleasure or for pain, if understood in the context of eternity, it's a, it's a very a brief and short period of time. Solomon say it's like a, a vapor, it's like a, a, a breath, all right? Uh, and and it, will, it will go off uh, uh, just as quickly as it, it, it comes. The only thing is our human tendency is when it's pleasure, right? Uh, uh, then we, 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 we value that length of time. But when it's pain, we want it to, to go off as quickly. But in, in essence and in reality, uh, both pleasure and pain on, on this earth uh, is but a vapor, a breath of, of, of time. All right? So we need to, to wait patiently for that day when there will be no more groaning, where there will be no, no more pain and no more sorrow. Okay, so while waiting for that, right, uh, uh, we, we can take comfort that uh, there is an eternal home waiting for us, there is an eternity waiting for us and that's why we need to invest for eternity. So I want to move to my second point now. Invest in the thing that scripture says uh, provides eternal rate of investment or eternal ROI. Uh, and there, there, there are three main things that provide, they are eternal, that, that will last uh, forever and ever. Uh, one is our relationship with God. I'm not going to cover this because we will be doing this uh, next Sunday. The, the, the second is uh, do not invest in fool's gold. Okay, and I will explain what I mean by this as we move to our, our second point. Uh, but invest your God-given talents to do the good works God has prepared in advance for you to do. Okay, so, so fool's gold, right, will not last for eternity. It's only temporal. Good works of God will have eternal value, all right? So let's look and see what we mean by fool's gold. Okay, um, this comes from the parable of the rich fool. 
In Luke 12, verse 13, Jesus says, Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Then he went on to tell this parable. He said, The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. So he said, This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. But very much like what the thinking of the world is today. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of grain and laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Okay? Uh, this, this is why man looks for happiness, fulfillment. They think they can find happiness and fulfillment uh, th th this way. Then look at what Jesus said, continue with the parable. He said, God said to him, You fool! This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Right? This is how it will be. Whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. In other words, if you invest in uh, uh, fool's gold, right? like, like this, 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 this man, uh, you, you are going to end up having nothing when you go into eternity. Only the things that are rich towards, towards God okay, will last for eternity. So, uh, scripture says, invest in things that are rich towards God. Okay? Uh, we know what things are that are rich towards men. So we don't invest in those. Okay? Those are things like possessions, uh, uh, very temporal things, things that we cannot carry with us to, to our eternal life. All right? And uh, uh, Ecclesiastes 4.7, uh, uh, it, it, it says that, uh, if, you, if you have this pers perspective, you toil and toil and, and toil, okay? And God does not give you the, the ability to, uh, to enjoy them. Uh, in fact, if like this case of this parable, God demands your, your life, every, everything is going to be in vain. Everything is going to be like uh, uh, grasping for the wind. And you have to leave all that you, you toil and work for to somebody else that, that didn't even work, didn't even toil. All right? And, and so is, is, is this the type of investment you want to invest in, in, in your, your, your life? Okay? And um, so James 4, 13 to 14 says, Our life is like a vapor. It appears for a little while and then it vanishes uh, uh, away. You know, uh, uh, John tells us in 1 John 2, 15 to 18, World is passing away and also its last earthly glory, fame, worldly recognition is all fading and it will pass uh, away. So Jesus says in Matthew 6, 19-24, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth because rust and moth destroy them. Earthly wealth will not last. So lay up treasures in heaven. So don't be like the fool investing in possession of this world. Don't be like the fool. Eat, drink and be merry all, all, all the, the, the time. And don't let the story of the rich fool become the story of our lives. All right? and, and, and in First Timothy 6, 17 to 19, Paul says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may hold off that which is truly life. So Paul says, Invest in good works, for this is the treasure in heaven. This will last right, for, for eternity. So what are these good works? Okay, this is what we want to, to, to look at. Um, you know, Ephesians 2.10, Paul tells us, Christians are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Okay? So good works are actually God's work. Right? Uh, in fact, if you read the gospel, uh, somebody asked Jesus, okay, uh, good teacher. And Jesus said, who is good except God? So, so if we substitute that, we know that good works is God's work. What is God's work? God's work is God's mission, right? And, and there are two important good works of God's work that we need to invest in. For, for this will last for eternity. The first is the gospel of Jesus Christ, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second is to build up the body of Christ for good 
works. Okay, so these are the two good works that we need to focus on, which has got eternal value. So let's talk about the good works of proclaiming the gospel. Uh, I will just briefly mention this because we have talked a lot about this. Souls of men and women are eternal. Right? We know that. So all people will spend eternity in either heaven or hell. All right? And, and, and our, our spiritual lives last for eternity. So we need to proclaim the gospel so that we can get people into the kingdom of God, into heaven. All right? So 1 Timothy 2, 3 says, This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be safe and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to be at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I was appointed to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is the good works that we need to, 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 to spend our time investing in. All right? the, the second good works I want to talk about uh, is building up the body of Christ. Now, every true believer has been set apart by God and for God. And uh, we were given certain spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Now to each, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. 1 Corinthians 14, 16. Everything must be done with our spiritual gifts so that the church may be built up. So Ephesians 4, 11, Paul says, Christ gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and whatever spiritual gifts God has given you to equip His people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. This is good works. If you are exercising your spiritual gifts, you are playing a significant role in the body of Christ and doing that which has eternal value. So every member of Christ's body can make meaningful contributions when we humbly seek to edify the body and to glorify God. You know, remember on earth, Christ has no body but ours, you know, no hands but ours, no feet but ours. And Christ is depending on us to carry out the good works that he came to establish in the kingdom of God when he was here on this earth. So spiritual gifts are way, God's way of administering grace to others and it will last for eternity you know jesus thought that he was coming back and that he will always we should always be ready and looking for his coming okay uh, he will give out rewards to us for faithful service in fact in matthew 16 27 he says for the son of man is going to come in his father's glory with his angels and then he will reward each person according to what he has done okay and the apostle paul also talks about this last last sunday uh, Elder Cillian mentioned this in, in, uh, about builders, okay? And that uh, if you are building on gold, silver, and costly stones, these are things that will last for eternity. If we are investing in things like wood, hay, and straw, these are things that will not last. These are things, things, things that will get burned up when, when, when uh, Christ comes again and tests our works. So we want to invest in gold, silver, and costly stones, okay? And uh, investing in God's good works will result in an eternal ROI. So I, I, want, I want to wrap everything up. You know, you, just now I talked about this, this line, right? So consider this line of eternity past and eternity uh, future. How would you represent your 80 years on, on this, this line, all right? Uh, our life will be nothing more than a dot on that line if we do not invest for eternity. Okay? And, and uh, so we need to consider how we should invest our life in the line instead of the dot. Okay? Uh, in fact, if we lose sight of the eternal things, we will lose, often lose our way in life and become solely focused on here and now. Okay? And, and uh, 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 you know, in conclusion, having an eternal perspective in many ways is the key to living a true Christ-following life. Okay? Uh, most of us do not see beyond the horizons of this world. To correct our short-sightedness, God prescribes a vision correction that allows us to look through the lens of eternity. Suddenly, if you look at through the lens of eternity, suddenly we realize that this present life is but a brief window of opportunity to invest in what will last for eternity. 
Okay? Uh, God is not interested in us investing in sugar water of wood, hay and straw. But God is interested in us investing in things of eternal value of gold, silver and costly stone. So my question, we come back to the question I posed at the beginning. Do you want to make sugar water or to make a difference with your life and to invest in something that really matters? How do you want to write or rewrite your life story to have significance? And the way to start is, is this. If you want to understand happiness and fulfillment, it lies in our significance. And our significance comes Right? When, when, when we understand eternity and when we invest for e eternity and that we will begin to lead significant lives for, for God for, and for Christ and when we do this, right, what will follow is happiness and fulfilment. Let's pray together as we uh, conclude our time this morning. Father, even as we heard of the story how Steve Jobs posed this question to John Scully, I know that your spirit is posing, Lord, to us this question of life. How are we spending the time, the short time that we have on this earth? How are we investing our life for the eternity that is to come when Jesus comes uh, again. Are we being short-sighted in, in our lives? Are, are we investing our lives in, in uh, avoiding pain and indulging in pleasures? Uh, are we investing our time, short time on this temporal earth in things that is going to get burned like wood and hay and stubble? Uh, things like possessions, things like treasures of the earth, Right? Things like uh, uh, houses and, and uh, uh, the riches of this, this world. Lord, we know that these things will, will not last. But Lord, you challenge us this morning to invest for eternity. Invest in a relationship with, with you. Invest in good works. Invest, Lord, in proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Invest, Lord, in freeing people, Lord, from the bondage of sin and, and uh, darkness and uh, uh, in the power of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Lord, building up the body of Christ, for these are things that will last for eternity. These are gold, Lord, precious stones, Lord, silver, Lord, that we need to build our lives in. So, Lord, we pray, Lord, this morning that as we consider your word, Lord, may, Lord, we make it our life's goal and mission, Lord, to invest for eternity. Lord, we pray and ask this, Lord, and commit ourselves to you in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. I'll just leave with you these questions. Uh, in the light of brevity of life and all that lies ahead in eternity, uh, reflect on these questions. The first one is, where are you setting your mind on at this time in your life? Why? And why is it so difficult to keep your minds on things above? Are you living for the dot or the line that we talked about? Are there any changes you need to make in order to live more for eternity in your everyday life? Changes in what you value, changes in how you spend your time, changes in your priorities. And finally, how can tem even temporal things be done in such a way as to gain eternal reward? So with that, uh, thank you very, very much and may God bless you in, in the coming week. Amen. All things are possible. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. Church, I want you to declare this. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Sing
Dear brothers and sisters, we trust that the Lord has ministered to you in a special way today. As we bring our online service to a close, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. May God bless you.